In this video, I want to define uh, directional derivatives uh, of a function like these that we've been studying. Um, and then I want to relate directional derivatives uh, to the, the total derivative of f um, using the chain rule. So let's first look at directional derivatives. Um, and just for reference, uh, got root in here. What I'm working on is something that's defined at the top of page 218. Okay, just if you have, want to have something to uh, reference. So let's say, uh, this blob represents e, and x is somewhere in e, and we're assuming that f is differentiable at x. Actually, uh, you know, we don't need this assumption for now. Let's just save that for later. Um, and let's, let's think about um, the value of f at x and the values that f takes along a line starting from x and heading off in a certain direction. So, to define a line starting at x and heading off in a certain direction, I can do this. Uh, x plus tv, where t is a parameter that, uh, as it varies, I move along the line. When t is 0, I'm back here at x. And v is a velocity vector for this linear trajectory. So v is some vector down here. That's v. <clears throat> so this linear path that I end up with is going to be um, well. I'll give it a name in a moment. But first, let me make this definition. If I look at the values that f takes along the linear path, um, then I can consider the rate of change of f along that linear path like this by just taking a derivative with respect to the t variable here. Remember I'm using this notation to refer to derivatives in the old sense of functions of one variable where you just have this limit definition of derivative. If you forgot what I meant, look at the first video of this lecture. Um, if you take the derivative at t equals zero, then you'd be looking at the instantaneous rate of change of the of the values of f right here. And um, that's, uh, remember that could be an m tuple of vectors since f is outputting m components. So what's meant by this, what is meant by this is the limit as um, So we have the limit as t goes to 0 of f of x plus tv minus f of x plus 0v all over uh, t. So just by definition of derivative, this is, this is what it would be. Um, except I guess it's more than just the um, definition of derivative that we learned about in 118a, since we are talking about a function of one variable with multiple outputs here. So uh, it's still defined this way, but this is a multiple output with multiple components. So this is an m tuple. This this limit um, is a limit over a real uh, variable, but it's taking it's of a uh, function with m components. So. Uh, what I've written here, this is what we define to be the directional derivative of f in the v direction, evaluated at x. Okay, and this limit may or may not exist. If it does exist, then we define it to be this. So this is if the limit exists. We will soon see that if I do bring in the assumption that f is differentiable at x, then we'll see that it follows by the chain rule that this limit exists and you can talk about this directional derivative. Okay, so this is the definition of the directional derivative of f 
at x in the v direction. So starting at x and then looking uh, along a line that travels along velocity vector v. Now I want to relate this, this is like a very uh, sort of geometrically intuitive thing to think about. I want to relate this thing to the uh, to the total derivative of f. So let's let's do that. So let me now clear out some space here. And this time I will have f differentiable at x. And I actually do want that picture. I want uh, I want to give a name to this linear path here. And you know, I drew the path just starting at x and starting at t equals zero, which is starting at the point x and moving forward. But you need sort of the forward and backward ver directions along the path because you know when you write down limit t goes to zero of that function you need you need to be looking at um, both sides as t is, is approaching zero from uh, positive values of t and, and also from negative values so really I should include um, a full path like that and I want to give this uh, path a name so let's call that gamma to define, well, okay, I need the domain of gamma. <coughs> so, um, I can't make the domain, <coughs> excuse me, I cannot make the domain of gamma be uh, all of the reals because then it, it gamma would exit the open set E. So let's, uh, let's make the domain of gamma be a certain neighborhood of zero. Um, since E is an open set, uh, there is some ball, some ball of positive radius centered at x, which is contained in E. So there is some r greater than 0, such that the ball of radius r centered at x is contained in E. Um, then... Let me decide how I'm going to define delta later, but the idea is going to be that if I now define gamma from minus delta to delta to, um, well, to Rm by gamma of t equals x plus t v, where v is fixed. So let's fix v in R n. So there's v. Um, then I want to be able to say, okay, gamma is actually mapping into E. So I want to make delta small enough to guarantee that I'm mapping into E. And um, hopefully it's plausible to, to think that this can be done. Let me just uh, go ahead and do it off screen. OK, it's done. So it's not really too important, but you can see some really fine print over here for uh, just me verifying that if I just let delta be this number, then I'll have gamma mapping, my, mapping this uh, neighborhood of 0 into E. There's my fine print argument. <clears throat> All right, and now my goal is to look at um, the directional derivative of f in the v direction. Here, the direction v is fixed, and I'm interested in that at x, if it exists, if it exists. Um, it's defined to be a certain limit, so it might not exist, right? So let's think about it. 
um, it is okay it is this by definition it's this limit and um, I really want to use the chain rule but I feel kind of constrained I cannot use the chain rule without using the fancy linear map way of looking at derivatives. Um, but if you look back to the first lecture, this sort of thing is a lot like the fancy linear map way of looking at derivatives, um, or it's related to it in the following way. Um, okay, so first let, let me rewrite it like this. This is f of gamma of t at t equals zero. And this is f composed with gamma prime at zero evaluated okay so so far if I just write that that's a linear map and evaluated at one okay so um, maybe that requires some comment uh, to see why why I'm saying that uh, let's see So to justify this, let me create some fine print like I did last time. Okay, so since uh, f composed with gamma is a map like this, um, we have that f composed with gamma prime is going to be a linear map. Sorry, once I evaluate it at zero, it's going to be a, uh, a linear map from r, from r1, because of this, to Rn. And by comments in the first part of the lecture, in, I guess I've numbered the lectures now so I can even reference them, lecture two, part one, This is going to be um, the function that, when applied to h, gives you this. This number times h. And so if you just uh, put in h equals 1, if you put in h equals 1, then you don't have this h sitting here. Um, then you have what I wrote down. So there's our fine print. There we go. Uh, oops. Here. <laughs> so here was our calculation. And to justify from here to here, it's this, this argument that we just made. And actually, I just remembered that um, in lecture two, part one, uh, when I said this, I think it was, I think I was saying it for linear maps from R to R, not for linear maps from R to Rn, right? I think I was focused on the case where I have a map from, you know, a function of a real variable with a real output rather than having a possible n-tuple output. Um, but uh, it should work the same way if you have an n-tuple output. Uh, it should work exactly the same way. And Okay, I, I do feel a little bit guilty about saying, uh, oh, it just works if you put n here. Um, but maybe you can accept it for now, and then for those who are interested, I'll put at the end of the video a justification of that portion. Um, all right, and it would be good to, you know, get practice with the definitions anyway. So, okay, let's get back to get back to it. So there is our justification for this step. And now I'm in a situation where I can apply the chain rule. And okay, I'm actually th there's another problem. Uh 
Here I'm talking about the derivative of f compose gamma, but I never assumed that f compose gamma has a derivative. Um, how do I know that it has one? So all I assumed at the very beginning is f is differentiable at x. How do I know that there's such a thing as f compose gamma prime at zero? In fact, this directional derivative, I'm just writing down a computation, but I don't even know if it exists. Maybe when you actually think about this limit, it does not exist. Okay, in fact, uh, it will end up existing. It's just that I'm justifying it after writing these things down, which is maybe not the best way to go. <clears throat> um, but uh, now that we've reached this step, it becomes clear. Things work out thanks to the chain rule. So the chain rule tells us if f is differentiable at uh, x and gamma is differentiable at 0, which is something we can prove, then f compose gamma is differentiable at 0. Note that gamma of 0 is x. Okay, so let's, let's make these arguments carefully. First, let me work on the derivative of gamma. So if you look at gamma, uh, it's x plus tv. Uh, immediately, you probably think the derivative of gamma is v, right? Well, uh, sort of, right? It, it's The derivative of gamma is going to end up being a linear map, uh, which is related to v. So let's... Uh, Let's work through. Uh, let's work through the derivative of gamma, so sort of on the side here. So we've got gamma is like this, and gamma of t is x plus t v. Then, um, what is gamma prime? What is gamma prime of zero? Does it exist? And what is it? Well, if it exists, let's just say what type of thing it is. It's always helpful to write the the types of things, even before you know what the things are. So I know that it's going to be some kind of linear map from R to Rn. And the way it's going to work is um, when you evaluate it at h, you get some vector in Rn, and I wonder what. What vector do I get? So my claim is that when you evaluate it at h, you get v, uh, you get h times v. And that is the sense in which the derivative of gamma is v. So to prove this, um, let's define a function, l, let's call it, from um, r to rn by L of H equals H V. V is fixed here. Then, let's use the definition of derivative to see if we can prove that L here is the derivative of gamma at zero. So the, defini the definition of derivative says, do gamma of zero plus H, so H minus gamma of zero minus L of H. And hopefully this limit ends up existing. Oops. Hopefully this limit ends up existing and being zero. Okay, so uh, gamma of H, that's um, x plus h v gamma of 0 that's x and l of h that's h v 
Ah, okay. So we have a familiar situation. This might remind you of when we were sh showing that the derivative of a linear map is itself. We just have zero in the numerator. So no problem. Okay, so this proves thus the derivative of gamma at zero exists and it's this function L that I defined. So this proves the claim here that gamma of zero at H is HV. Now, we can go back here and now we can use the chain rule. So um, by the claim over there, by claim, by the claim over there, gamma uh, is differentiable at zero and gamma prime zero is the L that I defined over there, that function that maps V to H times V. Let me not use L anymore. That was a temporary just for that proof. So gamma prime zero of H e equals LH for all H. Ah, sorry, not LH, uh, HV for all H. Uh, and we also know F is differentiable at gamma of zero, which is X. So now we can apply the chain rule. By the chain rule, we can apply the chain rule to analyze what is f composed with gamma prime at zero. f composed with gamma prime, uh, sorry, f composed with gamma all prime at zero is f prime of gamma of zero composed with, so it's this linear map composed with this other linear map, gamma prime of zero. So in other words, um, f prime at x composed with gamma prime at zero. All right, so now we can continue our uh, analysis here of the directional derivative of f in the v direction at x. So let me move some things around so I can just continue with this calculation. Okay, as you can see, I ended up crashing my entire whiteboard program, uh, trying to shift, shift things around, so I'll be right back. Okay, so now I'm working on recovering the calculation, and I figured I'll just unpause the, video, the recording. It might help to just see a summary of where we are. The directional derivative of f at x in the v direction, by definition, is this, um, which is, we said that this is, Well, we wrote it this way. We decided that uh, we defined a function gamma. Gamma of t is x plus tv. And so this is f composed with gamma uh, prime at t equals 0 evaluated at the vector 1. And then we use the chain rule. OK, so this is where we were last. We we verify that we can apply the chain rule to this derivative of a composite, and we get f prime of of gamma of zero, which is x, composed with gamma prime of zero, all evaluated at one. Okay, so let's keep going here. Here we get, uh, let me just carry out the composition, or evaluate the composition. We have this, and gamma prime of zero at one, that was the velocity of gamma. That's what we had found, which is V. 
so that's f prime x of v. And that's it. So, uh, so according to the chain rule, this f composed with gamma is differentiable. That means the derivative that this uh, directional derivative notation is defined to be uh, exists. And so just knowing that f was differentiable at x uh, was enough to know that the directional derivative of f for any v, v was arbitrary here, is going to exist at x, specifically at x. So knowing f is differentiable at x tells you the directional derivatives of f are differentiable at x. And this is what the directional derivative is. It's f prime x at v. So if f prime x was a confusing thing for you, uh, if you found it not to be an intuitive thing, this linear map f prime x, then here we are relating it directly to something really very intuitive. f prime x is the mapping from v to the directional derivative um, of f in the v direction at x. So let me summarize the entire result uh, of all this since the, the board got lost and uh, a lot of things happened. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is a theorem in Rudin actually, but let's just make it one of our theorems in our course. Uh, so this is what we have proven. Assume first that f maps e to r m x is in E, and f is differentiable at x. Then, for any vector v in Rn, uh, I haven't even said what n is. Okay, let's insert here E subset Rn open. So that then for any v in Rn, we have the directional derivative exists, the directional derivative of f in the v direction exists, uh, at x exists, and is f prime x v. So if you ever find yourself needing uh, an intuitive way of thinking about f prime x, think this think f prime x is that uh, is that uh, linear map which sends a vector v to the directional derivative of f at x in the v direction. That's what it is. Okay, and there is some additional explanation that I said I would give. Uh, at the end of the video. So if you're okay with everything so far, you can end the video and stop watching now. But if this step bothered you, uh, where this one came from, um, then keep watching. So I'm going to explain the general principle behind this. And it's what I intended to put actually in the first part of, in, in part one of lecture two. Um, but I think I didn't make it quite general enough what I put there. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so here's the, the general idea. Um, I want to relate uh, the DDT kind of notation derivative, the limit definition of derivative, to the funky linear map G prime of T version of things. And I want to establish a relationship between those two for any function G of one variable uh, with any number of components. Uh, what I did in the first lecture is I only talked about one one output, but I want any number of components here. Uh, so m, m tuple valued output. Um, so here's the general setting that I'm describing. Assume g is a function of one variable with m outputs and that we have a fixed point t naught, this real number in the domain of g. and Assume that this derivative exists. So let me, while referring to it, let me remind you what it means. It means the limit as t goes to t naught, or we could write something with t plus h or whatever, t naught plus h. But this is the same thing. Uh, g of t minus g of t naught over 
t minus t naught. All right, so this is our limit definition of derivative. And this is a real number. Sorry, I didn't finish the sentence. Assume it exists. Assume this limit exists. So assume g is differentiable at t naught in the traditional sense, in the sense of, um, I guess, not Abbott, since Abbott never did this, but in the sense of root in chapter 5, which we never looked at. But anyway, this is the tradition we never looked at in my 118b. But anyway, this is the traditional sense um, of, of derivative. Let's call it that. Um, then, then I claim that uh, that g is differentiable in the new fancy root in chapter nine sense at t naught and g prime t naught is a linear map that sends h to h times this vector, this m tuple. So h will be a scalar dt of gt at t equals t naught. So scalar times vector. All right. Uh, so let me prove this claim to fill in all the gaps uh, that, that I've left behind above. So define, to prove this, define, let's define a linear map L from R to R M by basically to be this thing that I claim G prime T naught does. Then we just need to look at the limit we just need to look at this limit, right? And if we show that uh, that this limit is zero, as h goes to zero, um, then we will know that L must be the derivative of g at t naught. So, okay, so actually let me get back to this limit in a moment. Let me just work on what's inside the limit. So g t naught plus h minus g t naught minus l h can be written like this. which uh, to deal with these absolute value h's, I can write this as the sine of h, meaning uh, one or negative one, depending on whether h is positive or negative respectively, times um, this stuff. And lh over h, that's a, uh, LH over H, let me just write down what that is. That's um, this number, d dt at t equals t naught of g of t. It's this number. So um, this thing whose limit I'm taking as H goes to zero is the sine of H, which is a bounded function uh, of h, it's one or minus one, times this thing, whose limit as h goes to zero is certainly zero. Why? Because this, uh, because, well, this is a constant as far as h is concerned, and this is, by definition, uh, something that limits to zero as h goes to zero. 
uh, sorry, by definition, it's something that limits to this number as h goes to zero. That's the definition of this number. So here is my argument. Um, the this one goes to zero. Sorry, goes to d d t g t at t equals t naught as h goes to zero by definition. By definition of d d t g t at t, t equals t naught, and then this thing as a whole therefore goes to zero as h goes to zero, and then we can say the same about the entire thing because this thing is bounded goes to zero as h goes to zero. So that that proves um, this goes to zero, which proves what I'm claiming up here, which is that L, this function, this linear map that sends h to h times this number, um, that that's what g prime of t naught is. Now, um, it, in the in this video, I used this fact a couple of times. Um, I used it, um, well, I guess I, I only used it once. I, I applied it to the case where g was f composed with gamma. So if, if, uh, if you had not already done this kind of argument uh, in your reading in Rudin so far, then now it's done and you have this general principle that if you have a function from the a function of one real variable with m components then its derivative is not exactly a velocity vector but it's very related to the velocity vector it's a linear map that sends any given h to h times the velocity vector <laughs>